Let's just pray. Father, I pray that you'd watch over the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well done, sis, for what you're doing. You know, I don't know where to start. I'm not normally tongue-tied, but today I'm so overwhelmed. You know, what happened was, last night we had a prayer meeting in this chapel. Now, this chapel, my late dad and I built in 1980. A lot of you weren't even born then. None of these guys were. And you know, the, these benches were made by an old Afrikaans gentleman, um, Johannes Nell, who's long gone to be with Jesus. And he'll be so proud and happy to know that you boys are using this place. We've had weddings in this place, and I've had funerals in this place. I've had times when I've married off my two daughters. It was one of the highest highlights of my life. I've also buried my little nephew and had his service, the one that fell off that tractor I was driving, in this church. So this church has got lots of mixed feelings. And as I'm listening to what's happening in our beloved South Africa, and those of you around the world, please pray for us. We need much prayer. And I was speaking to a friend of mine. He's the same age as me. Okay, just last night, and he comes from Johannesburg. And he was saying to me, Angus, I'm tired of all the negative talk in our country. People wanting to leave. People are not going on. People are wanting to do all kinds of things. And then I met these boys. And man, my faith is lifted. <laughs> because these guys have got their eyes focused on Jesus Christ. That scripture that I shared with you earlier on, which is um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. And you know, verse 9 says, to be well-pleasing to God. How can you become well-pleasing to God? By walking by faith. The Lord is not interested in our good works. He calls it filthy rags. That's exactly what Chris was talking about just a minute ago. It's by faith. Now, how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. You know, faith is my subject. And when I travel around the world, people say, please pray for me for more faith. I say, no, I won't pray for you for more faith. I will pray that God will give you a hunger for this book, my agricultural manual. This is the book that tells me to love my wife. This is the book that tells me not to antagonize my children or my grandchildren. This is the book that tells me a fair day's work for a fair day's pay. This is the book of life. This is the key that Carl was talking about that will open the door to the greatest moment in your life. Amen. And I'm going to be obedient to these young men. And at the close of this meeting, I'm going to pray for you. Because I believe that those boys are right on line. Some of us have still got areas in our lives that are locked shut. You need to open it today on the revival train. You need to say, Lord, forgive me for being arrogant. Forgive me for being self-centered. Forgive me for being selfish. And Lord, forgive me for walking in a state of fear when I'm telling everybody I'm a Christian. Some of us are spending more time listening to the news than we are reading the good news. And that's why we are so negative. Amen, boys? Amen. Can I have an amen? Amen. Those are men. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of them not even shaving yet, but they sound like men. <laughs> I want to say to you that faith is contagious. Faith is catchy. Faith, that's why I want to be around these young men. Because that's why I love coming to your church, uh, Sears. Because I hear faith. I don't hear negativeness. You know, some of these people, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, some of them are farmers. <laughs> That's right. You know, like the old farmer wakes up in the morning, he looks out of his window, the sun comes up, he says, here comes the drought. And then midday, the clouds start coming up, he says, here comes the floods. He's never happy. He's always complaining. I want to say something to somebody watching this program. You are sick in your body. Because you do not believe. You have turned that unforgiveness into bitterness. And the bitterness is turned into sickness. And you are physically sick. Today, if you say no more. I'm forgiving that person and I'm moving on with my life. You will be healed. Amen. It happened. I was in a little church in Great Down as a, a new believer. Not much older than these guys. And we were having an a, a, a altar call for healing. 
And this old lady came and she knelt at the altar rail and I said, Madam, what can I pray for? She said, I am plagued with, um, with headaches. I'm getting headaches all the time, serious headaches. I said to her, do you have somebody that in your family that you haven't forgiven? She was so angry with me. How can you say that? I come here for healing. I said, Madam, God's telling me that when you forgive that person, and she started crying, I said, God will take those headaches away from you. I prayed for her. She went out. She came back the next week. She said, Angus, this is the first time in 50 years I haven't had a headache all week. I want to tell you that most sickness is psychosomatic, and I'm not a doctor. I'm a servant of the greatest doctor who has ever lived, and his name is Jesus Christ. He's the friend of all these boys here, and he's my best friend. So today, we a band of university students. You know, I get so excited for these guys. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, D.L. Moody was an evangelist like me. He went to preach the gospel in England, okay? And C.T. Studd, the cricketer, the most eligible bachelor in the whole of England, okay? He got saved because his dad got saved. And the whole English cricket team, there's more than 11 here, got saved. And they went into China, they went all over the world preaching the gospel. I am so excited. Boys, please give the Lord a big clap, man. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. You know, you know, boys, I don't want to be too long because we're going to worship God again. And I don't want you to switch the television off Amen. when I'm finished preaching because they're going to sing a beautiful song for you. And then I'm going to pray for you after the song, not before the song. And I'm going to pray that God will increase your faith. You say to me, is that a good prayer, Angus? Well, that's the prayer that the disciples asked. Luke chapter 17, verse 5. The disciples came to Jesus when they saw how he drove out that demon. They couldn't do it. They said, Lord, please increase my faith to believe. I'm going to pray that prayer. And boys, if you want to pray that prayer with me, you can too. Because I want more faith. Because faith gets faith. John Wesley probably started the biggest revival this world's ever known. And John Wesley had an MA, Master of Arts, degree in theology. He went all the way to America to try and find the truth. He preached the gospel to the Red Indians. Not one got saved. He came all the way back across the Atlantic Ocean on a sailing boat. And they got into a storm and they thought the ship was going to sink. And he crept up the stairs and he looked and on the deck there was some German Moravians. Moms and dads, boys and girls hanging on to the mast. And they were singing hymns and praising God. And he realized, I don't know Jesus. I don't even know him. I know about him. You see, you can know this Bible off by heart. That doesn't make you a Christian. That makes you a history teacher. And there's too many history teachers around. People don't want to know about history. They want to know about him. Amen. He went to a little Bible study in a place called Aldersgate in London. And he said, a strange warmth came over my heart. He said, scales fell from my eyes. I believe he was born again and filled with the Spirit of God. And then on a horse... He traveled 225,000 miles. If you work in kilometers, you can multiply that by 2.2. That's unbelievable. My horse Snowy hasn't covered a third of that mileage yet. I said yet. He preached 40,000 sermons. He died at 89 years old. They said he wasn't even sick. He just simply wore out. That's what I want to do. I want to wear out for Christ. I just want to wear out. I don't want to be stuck in an old age home. Nothing, nothing wrong with old age homes. I preach in many of them and they do a fantastic job. But I want to preach the gospel until I die. Now I want to tell you a quick story before we sing. And this is a story that has changed my life forever. And this story comes from Cape Town. And this story involves this man who's heading up this group. There's a church in Stellenbosch called Shofar Church. I was invited to speak there. This young man's heading up something like 5,000 plus students from all over the country and the world. God told me clearly in my heart through the Bible that in Cape Town, they were suffering the worst drought, I think, in living memory. Is that correct? There was no water in Cape Town. It's not even a joke. 
Women were going into shopping malls and buying all the bottled water off the shelves because they literally thought they were going to die of thirst. That's how bad it was. The only city on earth that had no water. Nothing. That massive dam, the Tuya Tuya Vatas Kloof Dam. Sorry, I'm battling a bit here. <laughs> ah, but they're teaching me. That dam looked like a desert. There was nothing. And all I said that night was that Jesus said in 2 Chronicles 7 14, it's on the wall there. If my people who are called by my name, who are they? The Christians. Not the Muslims, not the Hindus, not the unbelievers, not the Hare Krishnas, the Christians. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I will bring water to Cape Town. That's all I said, nothing else. Remember, and we had 5,000 students that said together, Amen! Do that again. That was a bit poor. Amen! That is better. Can you imagine that 5,000 times more than this? It was amazing. I was so encouraged. I said, the rain's coming. I said, patch your, your canoes. Tell your Dumini to patch his canoe. <laughs> because he's going to need it to go down the streets. And what happened? Exactly. I walked out that meeting, I'll never forget. I was like floating. I was so excited because you, <laughs> you guys are such an amazing crowd of boys and girls. And my son Andy, my oldest son, was with me. And he said, Dad, yes, Andy, he said, you've dug a big hole tonight. I hope you can fill it. <laughs> well, that was the start. And then God did something else. He told me to go to the most dangerous place on the continent of Africa. That's a fact. They were telling me something up to nine men a day getting killed in gang wars. Is that right, Sears? That's right. Straight away, the devil says to me, who's going to go to that place? Anybody with any brains in their head will never go to that place. And then we made the date. And then we picked a spot. And then we heard that the Australian cricket team, the Wallabies, were coming to play the South African Proteus in Cape Town on the same afternoon. No pressure. And then we heard that the Stormers rugby team from Western Province was going to play the Queensland Reds professional rugby on the same afternoon. <laughs> now, any evangelist with any brains in his head would never have picked that date. <laughs> but I said, Lord, you gave me that date, it's staying. Mm. And then we started. We started praying, remember? Fasting and praying. And you know, I want to say something, and I don't want to go on about this, but I think it's good that the young boys can hear this. I picked up flack from the church. Oh, yes. That hurt me to this day. That brought me to tears. Who does he think he is telling us that we need to repent and then the rain will come? Well, that's what God told me. And that's what the word says. And that's what we did. I want to short circuit this because it's one of the highlights of my life, CS, and you were there with me. Do you know that we had something like between 250 and 300,000 people at Mitchell's Plain on that Saturday afternoon train on the sand dune. Amen! Amen! Amen at the back! I just want you to remember that this is a prayer meeting. And we are here to pray for our country. And we are here to pray for our leaders. And I want you to give them a big clap, please. Thank you. Can you give the Lord a clap for that? And I go on record that that is the biggest crowd they have ever seen in Western Province since Jan van Riebeck landed in the Cape. You're an evangelist, Angus. Yes, I am. But check it out. I think you'll find I'm not exaggerating. It was the most amazing afternoon. And now listen, guys, and this is huge. I've got the footage. You know, in the middle of the meeting, it started raining. 
You know, I could hardly preach. I was just crying. I was overwhelmed. Started raining on that afternoon. Not the day before. Not the day after. Right then. That's why I know that Jesus Christ is more real to me than you watching this program. And that's what I've told these young men. It doesn't matter what happens in South Africa. They can say what they like. They can, they can tell me that this country is finished. They can tell me the economy is finished. They can tell me there's hatred. Yeah, I'm telling you, Jesus is Lord. Amen. And I'm telling you, and mark my words, please. A revival is coming out of this catastrophe like the world has yet to see. Amen. Can we give a lot of clap, boys? Come on, man. Amen. When I finished preaching, when I finished preaching, I did something that I've never, ever done in my life before. I finished. I was so full of the Holy Spirit. The crowd was so responsive. When I think back, I, I, I quiver, you know, I shake. I said, I want to, to ask the gang leaders from Mitchell's Plain, not the gangsters, the gang leaders, I want you to come forward. And I want you to exchange your revolver for a Bible. And then I went quiet. Now, you know, to expose yourself in public is like suicide for these men. And the place went quiet. You could, have, you could hear a pin drop. Nothing happened. And I stood there. I was quite confident because I'd just seen what God had done. And I waited. I said, we're waiting. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And then I saw one man start walking forward. And as he started walking forward, I saw all these old mothers, these women that have been plagued with murder and, and drugs and gangsters, and just started weeping unashamedly. And as he walked up, another one walked up, 12 gang leaders came to the front. 12 gang leaders. I was overwhelmed. And then the Holy Spirit asked me to do something I've never done in my life before, and I'll probably never do it again. The Lord said, to go down and greet them. So I walked all the way down, and I walked up to each one of them, and I started to hug them. And the Lord said, give your hat to this man. I put it on his head. Then I took off my jacket. The Lord said, give this jacket to the next gang leader. Take off your cowboy boots. Give them to the next man. Take your Bible. It was my 70th birthday present that the Lord had prompted my children to get me from America. I gave it to another young man. I gave them everything. And there was weeping. There was no more to say. After that, I walked up. We started to sing. And we closed the meeting. I want to say to you, I don't know where they are today. It's not my business. It's God's business. And there's a word for you, young men. When you lead somebody to Christ, it's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to deliver. Mm. The Holy Spirit will bring that man to fruition. And I want to tell you now, and I'm going to show you some photographs. That uh, massive dam which feeds Cape Town, within four months, I think it was, it was overflowing. Can you give the Lord a clap for that? Yeah. Overflowing. Yeah. The experts said it'll take seven years if it, if it rains. And as I, I looked last week, it's still overflowing. <laughs> and it's raining all over the Cape, not here at Shalom, all over the Cape. And they've got so much water that they don't know what to do with it. They've probably asked me not to come back. <laughs> you, know, <well, laughs> you know, I want to say something to you. You're not going to believe this, but it's in the newspapers. You know that some people, <laughs> they wanted to sue me. <laughs> they said because the, the buildings were collapsing with so much rain. And a couple of people actually got, I think I actually died. And they wanted to sue me for murder. Listen, it's got nothing to do with me. It's to do with the weatherman. People say, oh, you're the weatherman. I say, no, 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 I'm not the weatherman. I'm the weatherman's son. I'm not the weatherman. Amen. And I want to say to you today, you can go and run. And you can run as far as you like. You can run to the South Pole. You can run to the North Pole. You can run to Australia. You can run to America. You can run to Great Britain. But I want to tell you something now. You will never run away from yourself. Because wherever you run, your troubles are going with you because your troubles are inside you. Amen. Now, we were having a little chat before the meeting, eh, boys? Oh. And we said, you know that the Lord says very clear in His Word that before you were conceived in your mother's womb, your days on this earth were allotted to you. You can't live one day longer. 
and you can't live one day shorter. So where, where's the problem? The problem is very simple. If God tells you to leave, now listen to me, then pack your bags and leave today. If God tells you to stay, then obviously you stay. If God doesn't say anything, then you stay. Yes, you don't make a plan. It doesn't work. So I want to pray for you, and then Chris is going to come, and the boys are going to sing a beautiful song. But I'm actually not going to pray. We're going to sing first, as I said, and then we're going to pray for more faith. And we're going to repent before God for not trusting God. I'm sick and tired of people telling me worldly statistics. I don't want them. Some of the best crops of maize I've ever had on this farm were in the worst conditions. Drought, floods, and whatever else. You see, when there's a drought, nobody's got maize. So the price of maize goes through the roof. So if you've got a very average crop, you can become, you can make a lot of money. And another year, you can have a bumper crop, and everybody's got a bumper crop, but you can't even give the base away because there's no price for it. So it's not about the conditions. It's about God. Amen. Okay, so Chris, can you come up with your guitar, son? And um, can you come and sing us a song? And I, I want us to sing. I don't know what song you're going to sing, Chris, but you, I'll leave that up to you. I would like you just to remain in an attitude of prayer because I know God is speaking to many of you right at this moment. And he's dealing with that fear in your life. You see, fear will kill you. Fear will cripple you. Jesus says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7. And from today on, you're going to go out. And when people say, this country is finished, you say, but God. Amen. And I'm not just talking about South Africa. I'm talking about the United States of America. I'm talking about Britain, Australia, and New Zealand. But God. I'd rather be where God wants me than anywhere else in the world. Okay, Chris, are you ready? Come in a bit closer, boys, and we're going to sing this song, and we're going to praise and worship the Lord. Amen. Amen.